Hi everyone, I'm Desiree LeCap, AK LeCapture. I'm a filmmaker who also shares educational tips and tricks all across social media. I am from the Bay Area. Hey Desiree! How's it going? Happy to be here. Thanks so much for doing this. As ever, how about we get started hearing how you got started being freelance? My freelance journey started officially a year ago. I was working a lot of, you know, nine to five jobs, but even leading up to being a freelancer, I was working at jobs that helped me build my skills. So I was a PA for the Golden State Warriors. I was an editor for Pac-12, so I was in sports for a while. And then I went on to a different company, SoFi Financing, was with a small creative studio as an editor. And also I would kind of say a DP in a way. Um, we were just starting out with the whole creative studio, but after about two years at that last job, I was like in the middle of also creating content while working there. And I was like, I think I could do this. I fully could. I trust myself. I could get into it. And no matter what, I could always fall back on going back to a job that I have nothing to lose. So that's kind of what started my freelancing journey. I believe it, if I want to go way back, it started when I first discovered filmmaking and I always, always had the mindset of creating opportunities for myself. So when I did discover that I liked film, I was like, okay, let me go grab my friends, create music videos just for fun or mini documentaries on people's interesting lives just so I could build up my reps. So I think everything leading up to when I quit my full-time six-figure job to fully pursue freelancing, it was scary. It really was. But Ever since then, it's been abundant and I would not go back to change anything. So were you in one company for quite a long time or by the very nature of what you do, would you have been going from company to company? So I was with this job for about two and a half years. I started off as a contractor, um, but then they brought me on full time. So I wouldn't even count that as freelancing because it, I'm not creating my own schedule or my own time. I think that's how I look at freelancing. I'm able to wake up, kind of put together my own checklist, my to-do list, see how my week goes. So during that period, though, of those two and a half years, for example, you were you still creating your own stuff outside yeah. of office hours? Absolutely. Even, to be honest, I was also creating while I was working because it was very hybrid. So I was like, oh, I'm home. I'm going to just film my own stuff. The day's looking pretty slow. I'll hop on meetings. Like I had a pretty good balance, but I think that's what continued to fill my cup in order for me to show up for this job. Because if I was just strictly just showing up for this job, although it was something that was helping me and that was creative, there was still this lack of like, ah, it does it's not fulfilling me. So I need to go do something that does fill my cup up, which is just going outside, bringing my camera, talking educational film tips and tricks. But even when I look back at my content, it's just, you know, the the evolution of how good and better it gets every single time because I've, I've learned how to light better, frame better, camera settings, like those all matter. But yeah, yeah. So how does it look for you now? What kind of stuff are you creating? Do you have um, various clients on the go at the same time or are you focused on creating your own stuff? Yeah, so I mean, going into this year, I start off this year at Sundance with Adobe, which was in a very inspiring experience. And that point, prior to that, actually last year I was very focused on educational film tips and tricks and inspiring other people to pick up the camera or do what they love. And I still love doing that. I really do. And while being at Sundance, I was like, my intention this year is that I want to create more narrative films and I want to get my reps in as a DP and connect with other filmmakers to make it happen. So we just wrapped up the production for our short film DeVille last two weeks ago, which was super fun, collaborating with friends especially and bringing in together a community to create this piece. Um, so that's more of what I want to do. During that time, the past two months, I did take a little break from social media because I was posting every single day and just creating content and educational tips and tricks because I love when I come across people in person, they're like, I'm loving what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. Like, that's what makes my like heart so happy because I love inspiring other people. So it's a good, it's a balance of it all, right? I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm like, I love that these opportunities to create short films is coming up. I love that I still get to create content 
when time allows and I am getting back into it. I literally, like a few days ago, wrote a whole page of ideas that I wanna get back into for posting content and just being more intentional with scheduling my weeks and days with like, okay, this week I'm gonna create content specifically to post just for me. This week is like, oh cool, we have a short film, let's get into it. Okay, this week is like, oh, I wanna work on my the business side of things. And it's just like, I could, how could I elevate my business, not just with content? Um, but yeah, there's so many things and it's a good balance. I'm still learning and I'm, I'm enjoying every minute of it. So it sounds like we should chat about the content. Like when did you start doing that? I started on TikTok actually, because I realized that TikTok's algorithm seemed easy to crack. And before I started posting educational film tips and tricks, I was posting like soul speaking session type. Like I'm a very spiritual person and I love to elaborate and and share my vulnerability with people because I want people to understand and know that they're not alone in this dark world that we may live in, right? But then it kind of cracked and I was like, I love, okay, with film, what can I do? So it started off with gimbal tips and tricks. There was one day and this was during my full-time job. I was like, oh, I'm going to make a list on how I could get 10 gimbal tips and tricks, like very beginner style, 10 gimbal moves. I listed it down. I called my friend and I was like, yo, can you meet me at the park and can you help me film this or be my subject? And then we went over there, shot it for like 30 minutes. I set up my tripod on my G7X, used my camera gimbal. And I was like, my intention with this is that I want to post every day for 15 days and try to get 10,000 followers on TikTok. I think at that time I was at like 2,500. I was like, by the end of this month, I'm gonna get 10K. And then it happened and I was like, okay, I'm gonna keep going and see what else I could do. So I was just kind of getting gaining inspiration from people on YouTube and like, oh, what are they doing with gimbals? So first it was gimbals, then it was lighting, then it was um, back to gimbals, but it was just a mixture of so many things. And then that's when brands started to recognize, like I remember my first brand, um, it wasn't a deal, it was just kind of gifted collaborations. It was with Small Rig and I was like, oh my gosh, like I could really make something out of this. And if I keep going, then then it could take me where I truly believe it, it'll take me and here I am, so. So when you hit 10,000, pretty quickly really, like did that, mm. how, how did that feel? Was it like, okay, this is just what it's meant to be? Yeah, I think it was exciting. It really was. And I try to practice celebrating myself in that moment. But I think from what I remember, I think I was like, okay, what's next? Right. And we're so quick to be like, oh, what's next? I'm, I'm ready to go on to this next goal instead of just marinating in this success and of accomplishing that goal. But I remember being so excited and, and that really pushed me to be like, oh, I could do this. And my goal is to leave this nine to five job eventually and pursue this full time because I know what could come out of it. And even if it doesn't, like whatever happens, happens for for a reason. Where are you at now, by the way, on TikTok? If this was about a year ago. Was sorry, when was this? Two years ago? About a year and a half ago. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. So one seventy one seventy. Wow. How did you think about yeah, basically creating revenue streams for you when you decided to go uh, full-time freelance to quit that job? I think it's still something I'm figuring out. Honestly, when I did quit, it was a huge risk, right? And a lot of people stay for stability and secu being secure because of health insurance and um, finances. But at the time, I think I had a few gigs lined up and I was like, oh, I could do this. Like, I think the very confirming gig I had was the one I had with Alicia Keys. And I was like, oh, I could, I could do this and I could drop this job and immediately after well not immediately after I quit but they did hire me back as a freelancer which was funny because I charged a lot more than <laughs> what they paid me and so that was also confirming and you know it is it's a very risky risky decision but as long as you know I believed in myself and I'm I'm very I'm one to move with like passion over profit because I truly believe it'll always tenfold regardless um, but it's not like that for everybody, right? It's gonna be such a worry in their heads, but I think that's the, that's the reframe that I have in my mind is that I'm so confident that even on slow months where I'm not getting any money, then this is my opportunity to create what I want to create and then put it out and then let like YouTube sit with that and like gain natural, uh, not natural, like revenue from like Instagram or YouTube or TikTok doesn't really count to me because TikTok doesn't pay much, but... <laughs> 
But yeah, I don't know. Um, that's kind of just how my mindset works when it comes to finances. Um, I just kind of not necessarily sit back and let it flow right because there are things that I'm still learning on the business side where I could I'm sleeping on a lot of money I really am if I've moved smart and I and I've and I did what I had planned because it is kind of tough I'm the producer I'm the writer I shoot I edit I film like I'm a one man woman I mean one woman band so the business side of it is just something I'm I'm I need to work on yeah it it seems like a new kind of model almost of freelancing. So traditionally, I guess I would speak to somebody in your industry, well, in any industry, really, as in they would go from uh, client to client, you know, like, oh, can you shoot this commercial? Can you shoot this music video or whatever? Um, and I guess you you still have that element that you can do. But then there's also, actually, I'm going to get this off my own back, create my own audience um, and bring in revenue that way. And actually, that could be through brand partnerships, through ad revenue, through teaching people through some kind of course or whatever. It, it's like that blend of creator and freelancer coming to the fore. Yeah, I think that's a big thing as well, because for me, a lot of my income comes from brand partnerships alongside with music videos, because I still do music videos. That's not something I post a lot, um, but I still do music videos. Sometimes I'll even tap into weddings uh, if needed. It's not really what I want, so I'll kind of know when to say no, when I'm just like, yeah, I don't think it's worth it. But um, yeah, there are a lot of things that I do on the side to also still kind of gain financial or keep financial stability like up there but mainly is brand partnerships right now but that's where I kind of go with the business side of it because I do have a lot planned like I, I'm launching my digital uh, products pretty soon and a lot of people ask for my color grading LUTs because I I've been <laughs> I've been sleeping on that a little bit so that's what I meant when I was like I'm sleeping on some money because people always ask for color LUTs or like a mini course and I have these courses built up from when I did Adobe Max last year so it was like all I have to do is take this tweak it a little bit and then post it for like an x amount of dollar and then people would would invest in it yeah so let's for for those who don't know videography or cinematography would be like a presets that people can use to get certain looks on their footage would that be right yeah yeah, you're correct. Yeah. yeah, it's like color grading and making it pop a certain way. That look um, and feel. And that Adobe relationship then, did that come out of them simply seeing what you were creating? Yeah, there's part of it that has. And um, I remember my very first partnership with them and I was like, oh, cool. It was with uh, through an agency, right? Because it's usually it's, it's creator agency brand. And um, recently, probably about a year ago, I... In most cases, I'm now directly working with Adobe, like with the team at Adobe, and it's really cool. I want to say it was with, and I'm going to shout her out, and I always do, Karina. I used to work with her at the Golden State Warriors, and she was a lead editor, and I always looked up to her because I was like, oh, I love women in film, and I'm inspired by her. And it was just a full circle moment because she actually works at Adobe, and I'm not, she doesn't take credit for this at all, but I'm like, dude, it's because of you, I feel like Adobe knows my name. Um, she just mentions that my name floats around with the Adobe team. So I think that's kind of how it was created was just one, my content and what showed what I could do. And also I want to say Karina as well. So, yeah. So would you say there's a, that mix of, as well as putting yourself in front of this audience of that still traditional network of people, that, like how long were you working in the industry for before you went freelance? Um, for about four years, four years. So the Golden State Pac-12 and SoFi, it would be about four and a half, five-ish years. But yeah, I would say it's word of mouth. It's knowing, it's networking, it's connections. I feel like that's a good chunk of how you could get into the industry because you could be so talented and know what you're doing, but it's like, you got to you got to also have the factor of being able to communicate and network with other people who could get who could help you get into these doors. So do you think it helps to have worked in-house first? 
I would, I feel like it's half, half. It kind of also depends, but through my personal experience, I want to say, yeah, that did help me out because there are a few people who kind of, uh, yeah, I think that has helped me because even working at my current, I mean, my current, my recent full-time job, I've met a lot of people because, because I was on sets helping out with shoots that they had have. So yeah, it, it helps extremely kind of being in those spaces. Okay, back with this conversation in a moment, but I just want to point out that this episode is supported by and recorded using Riverside. If you're making a podcast, if you're doing live streaming, maybe doing video testimonials with your clients, check it out. And when you stop recording, Riverside is just getting started. They make it so easy to create social content. Like with this episode, I could click in passion, and then I can create a clip, turn it into the vertical format for Instagram, and then put on some captions. And within seconds of finishing recording, I'm ready to start sharing it. It's free to get started. Go to beingfreelance.com slash Riverside. But if you do use a paid plan, make sure you use the code beingfreelance because it will save you 15, 1-5%. Thank you very much to Riverside for supporting this episode. Okay, speaking of which, let's get back to it. So one of the benefits you said of like how freelance life feels for you is the fact that you get to be in charge of your own schedule, your own flexibility. Yeah. Do, do, is there a rhythm to it? Is there a schedule? Um, how how yeah. does your day or week look? You know, I try to go by a schedule. I take it day by day, honestly, but even in the beginning of the week, I'll probably use it as like um, admin day on Mondays where I'm just like, okay, what do I have to do this week? How could I schedule out each day? And then from there, I'll take it day by day of writing like a mini sticky note of what I need to do. That way I'm not overwhelming myself. Um, These are when I'm in the studio, kind of more editing, pre-planning, storyboarding, a lot of those things. But when I have shoots scheduled, that's kind of more easier. It's like, how do I prep for this shoot that I have so the day before I'm prepping gear making sure everything's good we have shoot day um but yeah I think it really helps with having my physical calendar a physical calendar and a digital calendar um and also even writing it down I'm just such a person who writes everything first right and then I electronically organize my life afterwards but yeah a calendar has been super helpful with kind of maintaining that because I am still trying to learn how to balance you know like life work what do they say to get that work life balance yes work life balance that's still what i'm learning because i am so passionate about what i do like i love it i don't consider it a job so i'm just like but how do i take a step back from it that way i don't get tired of doing this so that's why i did take a break from social media because i never want to get tired of creating for for my audience because that's what i love to do but it's so quick to to burn ourselves out and not realize it so as i was approaching this burnout phase I was like oh okay wait let me take a step back because I truly enjoy this and I don't ever want to get tired of it Mm. what what would you say that felt like if you're approaching a burnout phase like how how are you recognizing that I think it's more like my body is telling me I'm tired it's the I don't feel like picking up a camera and doing this and I'm feeling it like it's forced like mentally it's just like I don't want to do this but like I'm picking up a camera and I'm doing it but then I don't, I don't feel myself flowing through it. I feel myself forcing through it. So it just, that's kind of how I know I'm burning out, where it's just I'm not naturally letting myself have fun with it. Because at the end of the day, I always want to have fun with it. But during that time, I found myself forcing a lot of what I was doing. Yeah. Were you posting ev- every day to TikTok and Instagram? Pretty much, yeah, almost every single day. It was a lot of batch recording. When I knew I was gonna go out to film, I was like, okay, I'm gonna bring probably three shirts, different hats, um, go to different spots of one location, and then just kind of create uh, content that I've listed out, whether it's just me talking in front of the camera, if it's film tips and tricks. I think that was the best way to execute posting every single day, is having batch recording days, and then having an editing day or two, right? Um, and then from there, just kind of scheduling out my content. So that way it's already, it's, it posts on its own. So if we're talking about that post, it's not like a story. It, it is a, it is yet another helpful piece of content that is teaching somebody every day. Yeah. 
for the most part, it was every day, especially last year. I could kind of tell this this year was a little bit like spotty, but last year was on pretty much every day. And then is there a rhythm to responding, you know, like to if you're getting comments and feedback and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I love responding to comments because I feel like that's how you build community and that's how they trust you, right? I'm not just posting and then leaving it. I'm responding to these people. If they have questions, that's kind of what I'm here for. It's like, oh, okay, well, if you have a more specific question about what I didn't touch on in the video, I'm here to respond to you. So I think it's really important to do that. I'll probably spend uh, a, a, not an hour, but like a good amount of time um, going through the videos I posted that week and kind of just responding or liking comments and just making sure that they feel seen because um, I think that's important. But how do you, like, I don't know, maybe this is just me, but it feels like if if I've posted something, <laughs> yeah. there's, that, there's that temptation just to almost keep checking because you, you, you do want to respond. Mm -hmm. um, so that temptation to constantly be picking up your phone and getting back on there and I wouldn't I'm sure be getting anywhere near as many comments so how how do you restrain yourself I feel like it came naturally to me from the get I feel like I've set this tone of like when I post I I let it just be and I forget about it and I think those are the best ones um because I did find myself like I'm not saying I never did it but I did find myself refreshing and being like ah it's not enough likes or it's not enough engagement should I delete it well why isn't it doing well I thought this was going to be um that I thought this was going to pop off so it's the ones that like which are almost all of them where I'm posting it and I let it go and I'm, I'm just like ah eh, whatever like I've worked on it and that's the detaching myself from the outcome and I practice that so heavily throughout my career, not just detaching myself from the final edit, but detaching myself from the expectation of how many likes it's going to receive, how many comments, um, how much engagement it gets. So detachment has been a big part of it. Yeah. In terms of actual client work, because um, you, you said about music videos and then you mentioned weddings, for example. But if we were to go to your website or check out your portfolio, are you only showing certain things? Yeah, so my website is actually not updated. <laughs> I was thinking about that yesterday. I was like, I should go in there and update a lot of it. But um, yeah, so I, there's a lot that I don't show that I do. Um, if that makes sense, it is mainly just music videos. It's showing things that I want to do for other people. Like I will do brand content. I mean, yeah, brand content or partnerships or also a brand will hire me to strictly just do UGC for their um, for their pages and stuff like that. I also do corporate gigs as like filming for like UCSF or hospitals or Google. I've done that in the past. Those are things that I've done um, as well, but I don't show it because I'm just like, I don't want to do those things, but I'm going to, I'm willing to, you know, so just posting what I want other people to hire me for. I like that. Yeah. You know, I know you've said, oh, I can do better business wise. But did you know what you were doing in terms of running it as a business, in terms of contracts or finances and all of those things beyond clearly being brilliantly creative? Did you know yeah. how to, to run the other side of it? Absolutely not. I'm still figuring it out and I'm learning as I'm going. And I think that's the that's the beauty of it, right? Like I've made mistakes in the past and I'm just like, oh, maybe I should have saved up for taxes. And like, you know, it's just those little mistakes that I've made, um, but I'm still learning. And eventually I do want to expand a team to where it's like, I could solely just focus on creating. Um, finances is gonna be uh, covered by someone who has knowledge in that, right? It's kind of bringing in different people with different talent. Um, so they could shine in what they do. You talk about a team there or potentially building a team. Is So when you go to work on a client project, is it just you as in you're filling a role or do people hire you to do something where you end up hiring? Oh, actually, I know somebody who can do that. I know somebody who can do this and you put a team together. It's a, it's a mix of both. It's either I just get on sets and I'm just the DP or I'm just an editor and they have their people but for most times like this short film I'm gathering crew like the camera department who's helping me out I do have my specific people who help me out 
whether it's like being an assistant camera or a gaffer for lighting or just shooting my content specifically. Yeah, just because I've created a community that I trust and I know their talents and I know know that we could that we bounce off of each other pretty well. Um, so yeah, it's a mix of both. And then would you get paid by the client and you pay them or are you all submitting your own invoices? Yeah, so I'm kind of the main point of contact for the client. I'll include in the invoice what the role is um, and then I'll forward that invoice or I'll have them send me an invoice and then that invoice is copied onto there so they, they know how much they're getting paid and what's on the contract. Nice. So that mm -hmm. does take on a... Um, an added complexity of cash flow, of managing people, of... Yeah. yeah, it's a lot. It is. I'm just like, I need to build a team because especially with editing now, like that's how I fell in love with post uh, filmmaking is post-production. But as I transition into a cinematographer, I'll always love editing. That is like, I know it like the back of my hand. It's a beautiful skill to have. But at the same time, I want to produce more. So it's like, to produce more, I'm going to have to outreach to other people to help me produce more, if that makes sense. Because it is a lot of labor of just like writing, filming myself, editing it, posting it, keeping track of it, putting ads behind it, and then marketing. You know, like it's just so much. Um, what have you found challenging in this first year? Ooh, I think it's a lot of... Just really accepting the fact that some months are going to be slower than others and that it's okay and that's my opportunity to take a break. Um, and it's also a lot of reframing my mind, if that makes sense. It's pretty cliche to say, but like a lot of the challenges are kind of making imposter syndrome your best friend, right? And it's just how do I continue being my biggest fan without having to be so hard on myself um and then i think i think it was the end of last year where it was it was pretty slow because it was surprisingly it was slow because it was the holidays and it was just like oh no brands are coming in like i'm just gonna have to sit back and wait and trust that like look my bank account's good everything's good and i shouldn't be worried about it because the more i worry about it the more i put into that um again i'm very spiritual so that's kind of what i believe in like we're um where attention goes, energy flows. So I'm just like, no, I, I'm confident in the fact that everything is happening exactly how it should. And yeah, and it's my opportunity to take a break. It's amazing really, isn't it? How much, how much of it is almost like giving yourself your own pep talks or being your own cheerleader or, or yeah. telling yourself to stop like I know you're your own boss but it's there's a whole lot more going on in the head yeah it really is and I think that's a lot of my content as well is just encouraging creators that it is okay to feel like some days where you're just kind of doubting yourself a little bit right because if those thoughts start to trickle in how can we reframe it and be like no it's okay to feel this right now in this moment I'm going to create space for it but then I'm going to allow it to pass by like a cloud. Because if we allow to ourselves to soak in it and dig ourselves a deeper hole, then how do we eventually like climb back out? It takes more to climb back out than to just create space and feel it. Um, so a lot of my content is based around that because I truly understand how it feels like for imposter syndrome to kick in. But let's look at it as like tough love from your mom. Like Personally for me, I've gotten tough love growing up and that's just their way of showing love. So it's like imposter syndrome. I kind of look at it like that. And earlier, you used the phrase, I think, pas passion over profit. I'm taking that to mean that you are following following what it is that what you want to be doing rather than perhaps just thinking about the money. Is, would that be? Yeah, because I feel like for me, it was never about the money. Like a, a lot of other people may chase, do just do this to, just to chase the money. But I truly believe that if I put everything I have, my blood, sweat, and tears into a project because I'm so passionate about it, then money's always going to flow in regardless because I'm showing f for it and I'm showing up for it because of what I put into that work. So yeah, a lot of it is, I mean, most of it is passion over project. Like I'll, someone's always just like, oh, like how much? I'm like, dude, we could talk about it. We really could. But 
I'm telling you, I'm here because I want to help you bring your vision to life as well. So we could talk about the back end. I truly believe in this project. I could see it going really far. So knowing that I touch this project, it's going to tenfold in the future. It really is. And I, I always have confidence in that. Back with the story in a moment. You know, you're not alone being freelance as well as the podcast that I've been doing for nearly 10 years. In fact, you really should go and check out the over 300 episodes that there are existing already in the world if you haven't. Um, we also have a community. Come join us. Go to beingfreelance.com. Click on community. It's a place where you can ask people's uh, opinions, you know, like sense check, bounce around ideas, celebrate, commiserate, get to know people doing what you're doing as a freelancer. Also, we have virtual co-working, a book club, live Q&As, uh, in real life and online socials. It's such a nice place to be. It all just feels a whole lot better when you do it surrounded by people who get it. Come find us, beingfreelance.com. Click on community. I'll see you in there. Okay, okay, back to this one. What do you think pays off in terms of client relationships? Um, or maybe maybe not just client. Maybe it's the this whole uh, community. You know, this network of of people. I'm not talking about the online world, but the actual people that you're dealing with, that you're working for, or working alongside. Like, what do you think makes good relationships in that respect? I think it's communication, transparency, and just being open when things are may be bothering each other because I've been in situations where it's just one could be frustrated and we know what frustration could do to our bodies and our minds and it, it creates resentment right so it's just open communication transparency showing up for your work and delivering um, when you say you would deliver so it's just kind of being going 100% in on what they hired you to do that way it's like in the future they're going to hire you again or they're going to be like, oh, I know so-and-so, they're really cool, like they've they've delivered on time, they show up, they're more early than like, than on time, right? Because, yeah, so I think that's really important. Yeah, so it kind of sounds like you're as passionate about their thing as you are about your own. Yeah, yeah, because sometimes you have to put aside, right? Because everybody's going to have different opinions and ideas, which is okay. And it's like, how do we meet in the middle to agree on an idea? But that's the collaborative process of it. It's like letting go of our own oh, no, it should be this way. But it's like they hired you to to create what they see in their heads. So it's like you could, they'll be open to your ideas, but at the end of the day, you cannot be so pissed off that they didn't take your idea and ran with it. I think that's where a lot of people get, like miscommunicate a collaboration or like being hired to do something is that um, I've often had to learn when I started was like, I can't take it personally when, for example, they didn't like this piece of the edit when they hired me to edit the video. I'm like, it's okay, like that's good feedback and that's not how they seen it. So it's like, I'm gonna let go of that and not sit with it and soak in it and just be like, okay, I'll fix it. So just those little things of just letting go of your ego and just showing up professionally. Is there, do you think, a challenge when, or maybe there's not because you've said that if you follow the passion, then ultimately the profit will come essentially. There's challenges though, for sure. Yeah, because what I'm thinking is, you know, like when you love, you love what you do so much, but ultimately you do need to look after yourself and make a living out of mm -hmm. it. Like, at what point do you stop and think, no, actually, I, I, I have to get paid for this. You know, yeah. like that, that side of it. I think it's the how much. Okay, because for me, honestly, if if the project does take a lot, a lot more labor um, and time, and it's also depending on my schedule as well, then I'll, I'd have to put my foot down if I really want to take this project on and being like, oh, this is kind of my rate. This is what I'm proposing to you. We could discuss it and then we could see how it works for both of us. But there are definitely times as although I do go passion over profit, right? Like you're right. I do need a, a roof over my head. I need food on my on my plate. Um, and sometimes it is a risk to be like, no, I'm gonna just do it for fun um, because I truly believe in the project, right? And down the road, it'll it'll come back to me. So yeah, it's just those times where I'm one, super packed in my schedule and I'm like, I can't take this on unless I'm getting paid. Um, so it's just this like balance of, of, do I really wanna do this or am I just doing it for the money? Like the the corporate gigs, those are good, easy money. So I'm just like, of course I need to get paid for that because 
it's it's kind of boring to do those to do those jobs. So I'm just like I prefer to get paid for it. Um, but yeah, that's it's just finding balance. Now, if you could tell your younger self one thing about being freelance, what would that be? Ooh, it would be to keep dreaming big. Um, sky's the limit. Nothing is impossible. And don't ever let tell let anybody tell you that your idea is too big because that doesn't exist. And to just keep going and pursuing and living your best authentic life and stepping into your power. Wow. Imagine if a version of Desiree came and whispered that in your ear. <laughs> wow. I might go sit on that and, and imagine it. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, thank you so much. Honestly, you've got to go to beingfreelance.com as they are for all of our guests. You can click through and find out what they're up to. And um, I mean, the fact that you've done it every day is is just a sterling achievement in itself and and speaks volumes about what you would bring to the jobs that you do so uh, m people obviously see that but they're so brilliantly made so please do go check them out and give Desiree a follow um but for now thank you so much and all the best being freelance yes thank you so much can i take a photo real quick <gasps> absolutely it'll just be a Where's my oh, I love it. Thank you.